Gentleman from Washington. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself as much time as I may consume. Gentleman is recognized. <clears throat> I rise in support of the resolution introduced by my colleague from New Jersey and chairman of the subcommittee, Mr. Lobiondo. Before I begin my, my remarks, I want to join Mr. Micah and, of course, I'm sure many others in offering my condolences to the entire Coast Guard family for the tragic loss of one of their shipmates during a drug interdiction operation in the waters off of Southern California this past weekend. We all recognize that the servicemen and women of the Coast Guard willingly and routinely expose themselves to highly dangerous conditions on behalf of our nation. Nevertheless, it's a profound tragedy when a service member makes that sacrifice, and our thoughts and prayers are with the Coast Guard at this time. The legislation I stand in support of today has been developed uh, as a compromise over the last two months with uh, negotiations with the Senate. It amends H.R. 2838, the Coast Guard and Maritime Transportation Act of 2012, and passed the House last November and incorporates numerous provisions from those amendments to H.R. 2838 that cleared the Senate in September. And I appreciate Mr. Lobiondo's willingness to work with me on this legislation to have a bipartisan and open manner. I'm confident in saying that this bill embodies a fair and bipartisan compromise for everyone involved and that we can feel proud of its, uh, proud of its work. As a ranking member of the Coast Guard Committee, it's been a high priority for me to advance certain things to revitalize and expand our domestic maritime industries. And this legislation marks a significant achievement in doing just that. It creates uh, jobs in the, uh, that are vital in the shipbuilding industry by taking steps towards improving our icebreaker fleet and finishing the program of record for response boat medium. Early, earlier this year, I had a chance to visit uh, job-creating shipyards that will be part of this modernization effort of the Coast Guard. These shipyards provide good-paying jobs for hardworking engineers, welders, electricians, mechanics, all over the Northwest and throughout the country. The reauthorization of the uh, Maritime Administration will improve the fortunes of those shipyards, and I'm pleased that that is included in this bill as well. But we've also, in authorizing the Coast Guard, reformed a number of key programs. The Coast Guard is one of the most expansive missions in the federal government. This multi-mission maritime military service is responsible for a broad range of activities, including mariner licensing, emergency oil response, vessel inspections, and navigation safety. The Coast Guard remains indispensable in the maintenance of a reliable and secure marine supply chain that supports maritime cargo operations, which contributes $649 billion annually to the U.S. GDP, sustaining more than 13 million jobs. This legislation authorizes funding levels for both the Coast Guard and the Reserve that provide for increased funding levels in fiscal years 13 and 14 over the fiscal year 12 level. And I believe that these funding levels in the bill re do remain insufficient to address the documented needs of the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard has been asked to do more with less, and I'm afraid that their only choice uh, in this time of, of, of budget uncertainty is to do less with less, and that's just wrong. So while I prefer these levels to be higher, I understand these funding levels are likely the best that can be provided under the constraints. We must be aware, however, that funding levels in this legislation are absent any consideration of what will be needed to address the estimated $260 million in damages to Coast Guard facilities in the Northeast as a result of Hurricane Sandy. These costs will be addressed in the future, I assume. And I want to highlight as well that this legislation contains several provisions that will improve Coast Guard's readiness and capabilities in the increasingly important Arctic region. Specifically, this bill directs the Coast Guard to complete a business case analysis to assess the cost effectiveness of reactivating its heavy icebreaker, the Polar Sea. This analysis is overdue and it is vitally important. At present, the Coast Guard has only one icebreaker, the Healy. And although the Coast Guard expects its 2013, in 2013 to reactivate the other heavy icebreaker, the Star, the plain fact remains the Coast Guard's icebreaker fleet remains severely undercapitalized and overextended. As it will be years before a new icebreaker can be delivered, it's essential that we make informed decisions on the Polar Sea now in order to have a balanced assessment of Coast Guard polar icebreaker capabilities in the near term. This legislation also advances provisions that address many administrative, personnel, procurement, and regulatory issues affecting the Coast Guard, specifically new authorities that bring the Coast Guard into parity with other armed services. These, these authorities have been included. Additionally, this legislation contains new authorities to improve efficiency and oversight of the Coast Guard's major acquisition programs especially new advanced procurement authority and development of multi-year capital investment programs. The bill includes language I authored that requires the Coast Guard to complete the procurement of 180 response boat mediums, or RBMs, as originally planned in the program of record for this vessel. 
This is a critical piece of maritime security, and the completion of these boats will lead to additional job creation in small shipyards. Besides addressing the needs of the Coast Guard, the legislation advances several important initiatives to support the U.S. Merchant Marine. Title III of the legislation protects the Jones Act by strengthening review and the notice requirements of future administrative waivers. It calls for um, the provision originally called for in H.R. 3202, the American Mariner Jobs Protection Act, could, uh, should help preserve more opportunities for U.S. carriers and seafarers. Commit, uh, the title also provides for formal authorization for the Committee on Maritime Transportation System. And Title IV of the legislation includes several provisions that improve the Maritime Administration's ability to accept, manage, and recycle vessels held in the National Defense Reserve Fleet. I'm also pleased that Title VI reauthors, reauthorizes the Marine Debris Research Re, uh, Reduction and Prevention Act. More and more marine debris from the 2011 Japanese tsunami continues to wash up on the shores of the Pacific Coast, including my state of Washington. Japan, in the midst of recovery from this disaster, though, has shown extraordinary leadership and friendship with the United States by recently announcing that they will donate directly $5 million to debris cleanup. It's important that we reauthorize the Marine Debris Act to ensure that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has the authority it needs to work with states to address this threat. So I very much appreciate the cooperation of Chairman Lobiondo for including this important environmental measure and also applaud my colleague, Mr. Thompson, for his work to uh, see this program reauthorized, and Mr. Farr. And in closing, Mr. Speaker, this legislation reflects a fair and balanced compromise. We have an obligation to support the Coast Guard and to support our U.S. Merchant Marine. To have a safe and secure maritime environment is good for job creation, good for the economy, and good for the American people. In my estimation, this legislation fulfills that obligation. I urge its passage today and just uh, briefly want to uh, thank once again, Mr. Lobiondo, for his incredible uh, work uh, to be bipartisan, and open, and transparent, working to uh, bring this legislation to passage. With that, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from New Jersey.